Well, I am thrilled to welcome everyone to tonight's Writer in Residence reception. I'm Joseph Finder, the author of 16 thrillers, including most recently a book called House on Fire, and I'm a board member of the Associates of the Boston Public Library. Tonight, we are officially welcoming our brand new writer in residence, Autumn Allen, to the program and celebrating our outgoing author, Shauna Thomas. Beyond facilitating the, writers, the writer in residence program, the Associates also works to preserve and protect treasures uh, in the library's special collections, such as Shakespeare's First Folio, letters by our founding fathers, historic letters by abolitionists, including Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth, prints by Toulouse-Lautrec, stunning illuminated medieval manuscripts, early photographs of Boston, and much more. Now, if you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the Zoom chat box. We'll answer questions at the end of the program. I am happy to turn the microphone over to a fellow board member, Alan Andres, who will tell us about the Writer in Residence program and will moderate this program. But first, a word about Alan. He's been on the board of the Associates since 1998 and has overseen the Writer in Residence program since its creation in 2003. He's the author of a number of books, including Chasing the Moon, the companion book to last year's PBS American Experience documentary series. Alan. Thank you, Joe. This is the 17th time we have met to celebrate a new Associates of the Boston Public Library Writer in Residence. However, as is obvious, this is the first time we're not meeting at the Boston Public Library itself. We usually meet in the Abbey Room. Despite the pandemic, we are attempting to keep the Writer in Residence program as active as possible, albeit with some alterations. This fellowship remains unique in the world, honoring an emerging, emerging writer of literature for children and young adults with an added financial support, a grant of $20,000, and under normal conditions, the use of a room of one's own at the Boston Public Library. The room itself has been described as a magical Hogwarts-like sanctum by some of the writers. Here you can see the room on the right. However, that, this is a room that was used up until recent years. Our new writer-in-residence room has a window onto the courtyard of the Boston Public Library and even a non-working fireplace. The fellowship was begun in 2004 as a way for the associates to not only continue its mission to support the BPLs, unique special collections, but to also pave the way for the future by assisting in the creation of new work that would be enjoyed by readers around the world. It redefines the Boston Public Library as not only a place where books are found on the shelves, but where they're also created. As of this date, more than 35 books have been published by past recipients of the Associates of the Writer in Residence program. The books written at the library under the auspices of this program range from historical sagas and graphic novels to fantasies and crime thrillers. Many have won awards from booksellers and literary foundations. Two titles written at the BPL have even been sold to major American film studios. Only a month ago, our 2015-2016 Writer-in-Residence Fellowship recipient, Jennifer de Leon, published her novel, Do Not Ask Me Where I Am From, with Athenaeum, a, a, a imprint of Simon & Schuster. Not only did the book garner stellar reviews already, but one of her online readings caught the eye of the internet's notorious room raider earning her a coveted high score. Also in the past year, Rabbit Cake, the well-received novel by our 2013-2014 writer-in-residence Annie Hartnett, 
and it was uh, sold to Amazon Studios for a future film adaptation. And he's eagerly awaited second novel titled Unlikely Animals will be published by Ballantine Books Random House next year. I want to thank the associates of the board of the Boston Pu of Public Library and president of the library, David Leonard, and the many who have generously volunteered to help read and judge the submissions each year. For more than a decade, our fellowship has, all, has been generously underwritten by an anonymous donor whose support has been essential. The donor's belief in this program has been the hidden story behind this fellowship, which has changed the lives of our writers and residents and changed the lives of readers around the world. And I'm happy to report that during the past year, our donor has decided to increase their support for the program, ensuring its future legacy in years to come. For those who may be learning about the Associate of the Writers in Residence program for the first time, it's open to emerging writers of promise who have not already established a professional career. Since its inception, the fellowship has followed a program of blind judging in which the panel selecting the recipient is not given any biographical background about the authors. They don't know their name, their age, their gender, their educational background, etc. Their judgment is based primarily on the quality of the submission and the promise of the book to be written. And it's based on their brief, a brief writing sample and a proposal in which they describe the book they intend to write. Each year, our judging panel is composed of a different assortment of professionals from the book world, acquisitions, editors, book critics, historians of children's literature, librarians, literary agents, publishing and marketing, marketing veterans and authors, all of whom generously volunteer to select our annual recipient. This year's panel was no different and following one of the most spirited and enlightening discussions in the short history of the fellowship, this time conducted in one of those now all too familiar Brady Bunch Zoom rooms, they reached their unanimous conclusion. However, as is customary each year, we first choose to celebrate our outgoing writer in residence, Shauna Thomas, who began writing her dystopian novel, Salvages, in a far, set in a far less dystopian existence than the somewhat wistfully remembered fall of 2019 when it was chosen. Before we knew that, what, that, a, that a contact tracer was a job title and the words 14 days to flatten the curve was not to be mistaken for a cheesy diet program. Shauna is a 2015 Yale graduate and the first recipient of the Grub Street Emerging Writer Fellowship. Salvages is an ambitious story of survival, transcendence, science, and magic set in the former United States after a period of traumatic political and environmental change. It employs an Afro-surrealist approach to tell the story of a 16-year-old with extraordinary abilities living in what had previously been New Orleans, but is now a te technocracy renamed NOLA. I now take great pleasure in introducing Shauna Thomas to tell us more about her novel and to read a brief excerpt. Shauna? A year ago today, um, I stood at a podium surrounded by my friends and my family and some strangers, um, nervously delivering a speech as the associates of the Boston Public Library's incoming writing, writer in residence. Uh, today, I sit at home at my computer, virtually surrounded uh, by friends, family, and some strangers, nervously delivering my speech as the associates of the Boston Public Library's outgoing writer in residence. Um, a lot has changed in the last year, um, but one thing that hasn't is that I'm still nervous, so <laughs> I'm going to try to be as brief as possible. Um, I want to share a bit about my fellowship experience. Um, just due to COVID-19, I would say I had a more unique fellowship experience um, than previous residents. Um, the first six months of the fellowship I spent um, working diligently in my office um, at the library. Uh, during that time, I did 
most of my writing, luckily. Woo! And I was able to do a ton of research and just restructuring of my novel. Um, and then when the library was forced to close, um, and I was forced to take that same diligence home and finish my novel. Um, it wasn't easy. <laughs> uh, besides the general stress of life during the pandemic, um, one of the reasons I applied for the fellowship in the first place was to have a room of my own to write in, and I missed my office so much. Um, and the floor space, because fun fact about me, whenever I was struggling with a part of my story, I would just sort of pace around asking myself questions and I'd figure out an answer. Um, and I'm also a huge planner, so I also covered my floor with note cards. Um, but some other challenges I faced uh, were the realization that I didn't have access to the chunk of resources for research that the library had to offer um, and having to recreate notes and stressing about COVID-19 while caring for my family, um, especially um, because one of my family members actually did contract it. But I got my novel done. Um, I finished and I wouldn't have been able to without the time support in the room of my own um, and funding that the associate to the Boston Health Library awarded me. And I'm super grateful. <laughs> like, thank you so much. I don't even know how to express how grateful I am for you guys' support. Um, I also want to thank a few other people who support me and everything to getting to done. Um, previous residents like Jorge and Jen, um, they really reached out to me. Um, they gave me a lot of support and encouragement and advice. Um, my family and friends for always being supportive of me, supportive of me um, and my writing. Um, my sci-fi and fantasy writing group members who've been like so helpful in the editing process. Uh, Grub Street for all their support and all the amazing classes and classmates I had that helped me shape early drafts of the story. And Stephanie, my teacher for like several Grub Street sci-fi and fantasy writing workshops, um, in which I started hammering out those early drafts. Um, for Autumn, I just want to share two pieces of advice as you begin your residence and your journey to complete your own novel. Um, just one, I want to encourage you to utilize all the resources that the library has to offer um, that you might need to tell your story. I ended up doing everything from like reviewing documentaries about Hurricane Katrina to watching old episodes of Chime to New Orleans recipe books, borrowing, all of which I got from the library. And second, I want to say, don't be afraid to be wrong. Um, I started my journey thinking I knew exactly what my novel was going to look like in the end, and I was wrong. <laughs> some plot points were changed, some subplots and characters were added or removed, and some stuff I thought was really amazing turned out to be terrible and vice versa. Um, my novel changed quite a bit from the novel I proposed a year ago, but I think it's much better for it. Um, so don't be afraid to be wrong and to experiment with your writing until you get it right. Um, now I'm going to read an excerpt from my novel, but well, yeah, you know, I'm just going to read an excerpt from my novel, um, Salvages. Um, last year, I read the prologue of the novel um, from Onyx's perspective. So this year, I'll be reading the first chapter told from Andre's perspective. Um, and most important to note is that it takes place in a flooded New Orleans um, that essentially is half above and half below water. There's no such thing as the below water if you're worthy enough to live above it. That's one thing we agree on above water. Sure, we all know below water exists, but knowing of and acknowledging it are two different things. Most people choose not to unless they have to, and most of us above never have to. From the back of a taxi boat, resisting pinching my nose from the rotten egg stench of stagnant water, I study the blue hole. It really took the dive bar idea and swam with it. The great flood might not have destroyed it, but the big bright blue building is tight roping distressed and condemned and leaning heavy on the condemned side. With even circles of hoses, pipes, and hanging gallon buckets wrapping around it like the rings on my third grade solar system model. The owner was smart enough to build it stilted, like the two dozen even more distressed shacks beside it, so at least it's still standing, a baby in the manger miracle for buildings below water. And from the number of boats tied on either side of its steps, the blue hole isn't just surviving, but thriving here. My ferryman, a gray-haired man with skin like a wrinkled brown grocery bag, looks back at me. That'll be $14. I take the money out my pocket, which seems to surprise him, like he's used to people haggling, so I give him a 20. By the end of the day, a 20, a 20 will be pocket change to me. 
The old man smiles, tipping his hat. Thank you very much. Next time you need a ride, I pick up at the same place on the hour. Thanks. I climb out the boat and onto the first step that isn't hidden by water. 100% sure I won't be coming back here again. I'll remember that. I head upstairs, passing by a group of men kneeling over a line of dominoes and four kids looking powdered sugar off their fingers from a plate of beignets between them. They wave hello and I grin back because you don't see many kids in NOLA anymore, above or below water. I open the screen door. It smells like sweat and fried food inside, but at least they are smells I'm used to. I don't see Mendo, just a ton of laughing, arguing, and whispering people. Close to the door, two men lean over a table with a slab of wood over two barrels can be called a table, arguing over batteries. Past them are a dozen picnic tables packed full. Across the tabletops, men and women exchange words, pork, socks, please, salt, lipstick, winks, squeezes, anything else they might be able to get something for. The Blue Hole might be a trade station. They're located all over the, bo the below water, according to Mendo, but I didn't realize they were this big or organized. There are three large blackboards on the wall to the right with a list of upcoming trades, buy-in costs, and highly sought items like fuel, tissue, and chlorine bleach. Easy grocery store buys above water. I squeeze between the tables looking for Mendo. Some people, mostly women, are nice enough to shake their heads no, some are annoyed enough to wave me off. The foreman at the, table, at the pool table in the corner don't even look up. You either got a sip or split, sir. The choice comes from the back of the room. I walk through the dining tables in the center of the room to a bar. There's a girl my age behind it pouring something from a metal pitcher into a glass. There's a sheen of sweat on her dark brown skin and her locks are all hanging over the left side of her face like she's two-faced or something, but the visible part looks nice enough. I lean over the bar, grinning at her like I would any mark. My friends call me Andre, beautiful. What do, you call your, what do yours call you? She fills a new glass without looking up. You either got a sip or split, sir. Her voice is so low now, I barely make out her words, but her annoyance is loud, reminding me that I'm not here to make a date or start a favor game. I clear my throat. I'm looking for my friend. His name's Mendo. No answer. Have you seen him, I ask a little louder. She finally looks up, eyes wide. What did that sign outside say again? Maybe the stuffy heat in here has gotten to her. The blue hole? Thought it might have changed the missing persons or something before you came in. She slaps her palms on the bar. You either got a sip or a split, sir. I stand up straight, studying the menu behind her. Red beans and rice, shrimp and grits, or catfish po'boys for meals, beignets for dessert, a choice between Diet Pop or Papa's beer for drinks, and a warning. If you came in here looking for water, you better look outside. I'll take two beers. I give the word air quotes to match the ones on the sign. Two? She tilts her head to the side. You're not from below water, huh? It's a statement, not a question. Once her eyes spot the silver identification cuff circling my wrist, I can feel her already low view of me plummeting like a bad worth score. I make it worse, like an idiot. You could drink one of them with me. She pushes the two glasses across the bar to me. That's eight dollars. I hand over a ten. She holds it up to the dim light above before, stif before stuffing it in her apron pocket and handing over my change. Anything else? Have you seen Mendo today? He came in here three times last week. At least according to Prophet, he did, and Prophet's never wrong. She sighs. What does he look like? Same shade of brown as me and a little taller than you. A lot of hair. If he's wearing a shirt, it's probably a black button down and it's probably half open. If the buttons are open, he has a tattoo on his chest of a bird. What kind? I know nothing about birds and Mendo has never shared anything about his tattoo or its meaning with me. I don't know, a small one? A pigeon, a canary, a finch, a lo yeah, one of those. Have you seen him? Never met him. Anything else? It's too late to buy in for today's trade, but you can try for tomorrow if you pay the late sign-up fee. Her words come out in a fast-flowing stream as she shakes her head no. I know lying when I hear it, especially from someone so awful at it. She's lying her best, but it's useless. The only person who can outline me is Mendo. Did he tell you to lie for him, I ask? I never met him. I lean over the bar again until we're eye to eye. Both times you answered, you shook your head. Before you answered, your eyes darted back and forth. I think you're lying. Her top lip curls up. I don't care what you think. I fish in my pocket for another ten and slide it across the bar to her. She picks it up. A tip? She can call it whatever she wants. Sure. Do you have one for me? She stuffs the tin in her pocket. Sure. Trade's terrible tomorrow. Don't bother coming. She turns, heading for the door of what must be the kitchen behind her. 
I run a hand down my face. My gut's telling me something's wrong. Mendo never stays out all night, but I also don't want to upset any favor game Mendo's running here, if that's all it is. I'm not looking for trouble. I'm just looking for my brother, I blurt out. She actually turns back around at that. You said he was your friend. Blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb, I quote. Not to me. She folds her arms across her chest. Like ain't the same as is, so which is it? Y'all friends are blood brothers. We're flood brothers, I say. I owe him my life. She doesn't answer, but she doesn't turn away again either. He didn't come home last night without warning. I just want to make sure he's okay. She tilts her head again, considering me. Then she jerks her thumb at a wide hallway running along the bar. Last I saw him, they were in the break room down the hall. I agreed to stay, Mom. I ain't no liar. I never met your friend. They, I repeat. Him and Gilbert. Gil, I head for the hallway. I don't know, I don't know how... <clears throat> But she got around the bar so quickly, but she follows me, trying to get me to stop. I feel bad since I did say I wasn't looking for trouble, but I really wasn't when I said it. Besides, it's not her who's in for trouble. The break room is near the end of the hall on the left. Before I can turn the knob to open it, the door swings out right at my face. I jump back fast enough to avoid being hit, but I almost knock down the bar girl on my, he on my heels as the door is pulled closed again. She ignores my apology, squeezing past me to bang on the door. Gilbert, it's just me. Your boyfriend's friend is looking for him. The door swings open again. I close my eyes and count to three, hoping that when I open them, some other Gilbert will be standing there. But of course, it's Gilbert, Gilbert, one hand blocking Mendo from leaving, the other tucking his shirt in his pants. Just to talk, he said. The bar girl grumbles a little too loudly to be considered under her breath. Long time no see, Andre. Shauna, uh, this is David Leonard, okay. president of the Boston Public Library. I think I'm up next. Um, Thank you so much for sharing uh, this extract of your work uh, with us this evening. Um, thank you for sharing your year with us, uh, the first part of it in person and the latter part of it virtually. Um, and uh, as is our tradition, I'm uh, now happy to accept virtually uh, a copy of your manuscript, which we will do later at some point in person. And it will join the manuscripts of the previous writers in residence uh, which in turn are now part of our almost 23 million items in the collection at the Boston Public Library. So, so once again, congratulations to, to you. And I know uh, we can't hear all of your, thank you. We can't hear all of your, uh, we can't hear all of your friends and family who are here celebrating with you virtually tonight, but we welcome them. And uh, in a few minutes, we'll also welcome Autumn and her family and friends who, uh, who are part of our celebration tonight. And so at this point in time, I just want to thank uh, Alan and Joe and all of the associates and their donors and supporters who help bring programs to life and help care for our collections at the Boston Public Library. Um, so a few thoughts on, on where we are and the relationship between reading and writing at this time. During this time of COVID-19, uh, marked by much tragic loss of life, a public health emergency, and economic challenges not seen in a generation, here at the library, and I mean here by our virtual space and our physical space, here at the library, interest in reading and writing, as we have seen in transactions with our patrons over the last six months, could not be stronger. Uh, we have seen uh, increased demand for reading and through partnerships like this one and others, uh, we know that people are choosing to write and put thoughts on paper at this time or, or thoughts on a keyboard at this time. Secondly, at this time in our nation's history, where we may once again have found an appetite for confronting systemic racism, we also see demand for books about Black Lives Matter, books about how to be an anti-racist, experience an increased demand exponentially, both in electronic content and in person. And the library is thrilled to be able to divert additional funds to support that demand from among our reading population. And so with the support of the associates and others, with the work of the library in the community and with the community, and just promoting the inquiring mind, the quest for knowledge, for story, for trusted information. Let us continue building, reading, and writing a better society, one book at a time. 
Thank you both. Alan, I think I'm back to you. All right, thank you, David. Um, and now let's turn to our newest writer in residence. Adam Allen of Norwood already holds a distinction with one of our previous writers, Jennifer De Leon, who I mentioned earlier, has just published her novel, Do Not Ask Where I'm From. Like Jen, Adam had been a runner up for the fellowship in a past year. With persistence, she reapplied and we're delighted to welcome her this year even if the use of the writer's room at the BPL may not be readily available right now. Her proposed work, All You Have to Do, is a historical novel set in 1968 and in 1995, telling the story of two generations of a black middle-class family in alter alter alternating narrative threads. Autumn received a BA in literature from Yale University and a master's degree in education from Harvard University. And her MA, MFA in children's literature and writing for children from Simmons. She spent 15 years as an educator before returning to her first love, writing. And when she saw, she saw the need for more books that affirm the identities of her children and the communities she served. It is an honor to introduce Autumn Allen, the 2020-2021 Associates of the Boston Public Library Writer-in-Residence. Autumn. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Alan, and thank you to all the associates. Thank you, Shauna. Um, thank you, everyone who's here tonight. It really warmed my heart to see all the familiar names in the chat. Thank you for coming out and listening tonight. Uh, I'm honored to be chosen for this program and I want to start by thanking everyone who's made it possible. Um, thank you to the associates of the BPL and the anonymous donor who funds the Writer in Residence program. Thank you to the selection committee for valuing my story and giving me this opportunity to focus on bringing it to the world. Uh, my family who inspires my writing and encourages me whenever I need it. Special thanks to my brother who shared his early experiences with me when I was drafting um, the very first draft of this story. Everyone in my life and in my mother's life who has held me and my family up during our recent loss. Um, my friends, my writing teachers from years ago, one of whom I think is here, uh, my writing partners, my critique group who are here, uh, women of words, my teachers, mentors, and colleagues from Simmons who helped shape my passion for children's literature and helped me find my voice. And I also have to thank the New York Public Library for the research fellowship they granted me last year to complete the historical research for this book. Spending a month at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture was absolutely life-changing. And finally, I thank the creator for arranging my life in unexpected ways to bring out the best in me. So all you have to do is a story I've been working on for about two years. I have two or three drafts behind me, depending how you count. Um, and I plan to spend this year revising the manuscript, hopefully for the last time. The challenge in a story like mine that has multiple narrators and moves between time periods is making sure that each narrator's story is complete and that the two stories interact in a meaningful way. So my challenge this year is really the architecture of the novel and getting all of that right. I took a few months off from the novel, from the manuscript, and I dove back in last weekend to begin the residency. And so that distance that I had um, of time was really helpful to reread it with a detached and critical eye. So I'm seeing what needs to change and I'm looking forward to this new stage of editing and revision and imagining new possibilities. The Boston Public Library is one of my favorite places, so I hope I'll be able to use the office there at some point this year. But in the meantime, I'm working remotely from home and using space in my mother's art studio, which is just as inspiring. I recently had the great pleasure of finding an agent, hi Tina, <laughs> and I'm already finding that having a sounding board for my ideas as I try different things with this revision is a great help. So I'm very encouraged and hopeful that I'll have a productive year. Um, I wanna give some encouragement to fellow writers who are near the beginning of their journeys. Um, I applied for this residency in 2018, um, and that was sort of the first draft of my story. And I applied again in 2019. And this year I submitted an application almost out of habit, not expecting or hoping that I might get it. I kind of submitted it and completely forgot about it, even though I had been a finalist in 2018. 
So when I received the phone call, I was truly shocked. Um, and it was a very strange time in my life and sort of hard to get really excited, but I spent that, you know, a few weeks wondering why I got it this year and not before, but I believe things happen when the time is right. Um, but I also know that I put a lot of work into my craft and drafts during those two years between my first application and my success, successful application. I had an MFA, but I have spent these two years teaching myself to really, you know, revise and be purposeful in my drafts. So now that I have this opportunity, I'm ready for it. So my advice to writers is to apply widely and often for various opportunities. Keep working on your craft in between and focus on getting better. And the opportunities will come knocking when you're really ready for them. So my novel, All You Have to Do, follows two young black men in historically white schools. In April 1968, after the assassination of Dr. King, Kevin becomes involved in a student protest at Columbia. And in 1995, amidst controversy over the Million Man March, Gibran challenges his private school's culture. My characters have strong opinions and feelings, and that's because those are traits that fascinate me in real life. When I write, I'm asking questions and seeking answers. So some of the questions I'm exploring as I write this book are, how does each generation experience race differently? How does racial socialization within families and schools affect relationships, personalities, and life choices? How does gender affect those outcomes? What does it mean to choose a good school or a good neighborhood? And what is the human cost of the American dream for those who weren't meant to have it? Why do some people turn away from the opportunities they're given? The process of writing and exploring these questions has been really rewarding for me, and I hope the final product will inspire reflection and conversation among others. So I'm going to read two short scenes from the beginning of the novel. The first one takes place before the assassination of Dr. King, and the second one takes place hours after the assassination. April 4th, 1968. Kevin. I finished a leisurely lunch, alone in the dining hall, when Charles comes rushing in. He approaches my table, sees that I finished, and keeps his book bag on his shoulder. You can put your stuff down, I tell him. But aren't you getting ready to leave? I shrug. I'm not in a rush. He hesitates. Don't you have stu finals to study for? Research papers to write? I wave those thoughts away with one swat. Finals are a month away. I'd rather be reading this, I say, showing him my new copy of Black Power, another find at Bichot's bookshop. His shoulders sag dramatically and he rolls his eyes. For your sake, he says, as he drops his bag in the seat opposite me, I really hope you do get your Black Studies courses created before you graduate. You need to get credit for all this extracurricular reading you do. Leave it to Charles to not be excited about this new book. Why do you say you're, as if you're not one of us, I ask him. It doesn't matter to you if you have to study white people all the time. I'm a science major, he says, as if that answers the question. And besides, I studied Black people all 12 years, probably the one benefit of going to a segregated one-room school. I'll bet I know more about Black history than any of your poli-sci professors. He pops the last meatball from my plate into his mouth and moves to get in line for food. You don't act like it, I call after him, sulking, as I turn back to my book. <clears throat> April 5th, 1968. Kevin. Harlem is on fire. Orange flames reach out of broken store windows and lick the sidewalks. Black smoke escapes through iron bars, rising to reach the sky. I can almost smell the smoke, almost hear the tinkling of shattered glass. It's calming, peaceful. After the news we got tonight, the whole world should be on fire. It almost is, the Black American world, but I don't know it yet. Right now, I just watch and let the city's reaction relieve me of the need to explode. I don't chastise myself, not yet, for not being on the streets myself. In Harlem, there is no violence. No one gets hurt. The police must be on orders to stand down. They pace, watching as people flee with food, diapers, clothing, helping each other, caring for each other. Maybe tonight, tear gas won't burn their eyes. Maybe this time, no batons will, will crack skulls. You think the riots will reach these ivy walls? Charles is at my door. He must have opened it without my noticing. I stay mesmerized by the sights outside. We hear sirens. Charles crosses my tiny dorm room to watch with me. The lights are red, not blue. Perhaps more life, not death. What they see tonight may teach them once and for all. These riots are the price we pay for having ghettos, these kerosene kegs of society. We cover it up, we look away, we blame the victims, pressure builds. An explosion every few years, 
an opportunity to see, to really see, and to rebuild. We take it or we miss it. We always choose to miss it. And the cycle continues on. And so the explosion becomes, a point, becomes the point, a moment of seeming power, not the catalyst it should be. I sigh. Must feel good. Charles looks at me. I stare at the street. I wish it would reach these ivy walls. I don't look at him. Don't want to see what plagues him in his open, honest, faithful face. He sits on my bed and wipes his face with his hands. He was probably trying to study. Always the responsible student, success at any cost. I want to admire his discipline, but mostly I look down on him, like I look down on my parents for their optimism in the face of all the evidence against progress. Remember, I say, when we burned those newspapers, so close to the student center, People thought we were going to burn this mother to the ground. He stares at the floor, shakes his head. Someone said if this school doesn't make some changes, there's going to be book burnings and building burnings. I say what he is afraid to say. He nods and wrings his hands, rubs his legs nervously. He is afraid. He has everything to gain here. And if he loses this chance, he thinks he'll lose everything. That's the burden his family has sent him here carrying. This degree is his everything the crowning achievement of his family. For me, it's a bare minimum, one step on the way to everything else. I want to sit with Charles and relieve his burden, but I don't know the words that will do that. So we watch and watch, thinking our separate thoughts. We don't have to worry about the riots reaching these walls, these iron gates that enclose us. Harlem and Columbia are two separate worlds, adjacent but never mixing, an impenetrable barrier between them. Not even the murder of the King of Peace can tear that divide. By 1 a.m., the streets are quiet. It is the shortest riot in history, but the trouble has only just begun. There were assassinations before. There have been deaths, violence. It's not that no one ever expected it to happen to King. It's that this time, we were ready. So that's a taste of the characters and setting of one part of the novel. Um, so right now I'm picking apart the scenes, putting them back together again, and I hope that when it's out, you will all read it and enjoy it. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for the applause. I see some questions. I know Kathleen was supposed to field the questions, but since there are a few for me, I'll just start answering them. Um, how my research at the Schomburg Center impacted my writing? Uh, it impacted it tremendously. Um, I went there so that I could get a sense of the daily life of people in um, the 1960s, and I was amazed to see that there were so many similarities between um, the way, the types of things people were saying in the 60s, um, and the way people felt, and just, you know, the lived experience um, from the 60s to the 90s, and even today. Um, and I also found out about some of the more um, newsworthy uh, takeovers that happened on the college campuses, such as the one at Columbia, which lasted a week and which became a major part of my book. Um, so it was, I mean, I could have stayed there for a year and, you know, learned more and more, but um, it was tremendously impactful. Um, and then how did the story change from the first time I applied to the program in 2018 and now that I've been chosen? Um, it changed quite a bit. Um, so in the beginning I had um, a young man and his mother and their stories were alternating. And at this point I have a young man and his uncle with their stories alternating. Um, and you sort of see um, the mother slash sister um, as she interacts with the two of them. Um, but I'm still <laughs> exploring and I'm not sure what the final product will be. What did I use for research for 1968? The Schomburg Center mostly, but there are a lot of articles online too. So I think we have another question as well. One is, how did you keep track of the separate narratives? Um, there's a program called Scrivener, which writers talk about a lot. And I heard about it and I just didn't want to try something new, but I finally said, okay, there's a free trial. Let me just check it out. And it was life-changing because <laughs> um, you can just, you know, 
take your scenes and move them around as you see fit. So that's how I outlined and um, completed this most recent draft. Uh, and we actually have a question for Shauna. So what are the next uh, steps for your story? Um, so right now, a long break. <laughs> I'm just gonna put it to the side for a bit. <laughs> and in the new year, I hope to look at it with fresh eyes and start the process and figuring out um, what I wanna do with it. Um, I obviously want to one day have it be a book that can be read um, widely, but I also just, one just takes some time to just <laughs> um, be at peace with what I've created right now. Is there any other question? Oh, it looks like we have another one uh, for both writers. So do you have a daily ritual for writing? And if so, what does that entail? Um, not a ritual necessarily. I am someone who writes, I write, I think I write way better at like 4 a.m. than I do at any regular time of the day, but I don't know. Um, but not necessarily a routine. I just try to set a goal in terms of, and I write in scenes, so I try to set a goal in scenes of what I need to be done with, and I give myself the day to get to that point, so. Um, for me, it completely depends on where I am with a draft. So if I'm drafting, I do need to have a daily ritual where I get up every morning and I just write for as long as possible, which usually is just until my youngest child comes in my room and tells me she's hungry. Um, if I'm not drafting, then I'm not as strict about uh, being involved with the, um, with the manuscript every day. Um, so like right now I'm working weekends and you know that longer chunks periods of time is more useful for revision because I can really sort of think and strategize. And similar to that we have another question of how um, to either one of you, um, advice about how to balance writing with life. That's such a funny question, because when I think about uh, this past year, writing was essentially my life, so <laughs> it, it all blended together very nicely there. Um, but I was also doing my fellowship while working, so um, to me, it was just a matter of making schedules and sticking hard to them, um, both in my life and in my writing, and just trying my hardest not to compromise on either side. Um, I will say it was, I wasn't always perfect about that um, in terms of just, I got really, really, really intensely focused <laughs> on writing this year, which I'm very happy about because I've never had the opportunity to be so intensely focused, um, but I will say it didn't always balance out well in like life and writing. It doesn't, and I don't think it ever always balances, but all I can say is you can try to do your best in that end. Yeah, I would say for me, what helps is deadlines. And um, I print out a calendar and put it right next to my workspace. And for every day that I write, even if it's one sentence or one paragraph, I write a check mark in a certain color. So the, the, uh, the object is to never miss a day. Um, so something about that visual, it's kind of like giving stickers to a kid, <laughs> it just makes you feel accomplished. So that's, um, that's one way I, I keep myself consistent. So we have another great question for both of you. What is your best advice for writers who doubt the value of the stories that they are writing? I know um, one thing I remember from Stephen King's book on writing is that he has an ideal reader and for him it's his wife. Um, but if you have someone that you write for whose opinion matters the most, um, you can just write for them and or for yourself. And if, you know, if it works for them, then you, you know, it wasn't a waste of time. So 
for example, my mom, when I finished reading her aloud, the first draft of the story, she declared it a bestseller. So even if it doesn't make the New York Times bestseller list, it doesn't matter because my mom decided it was bestseller. So <laughs> that's one tip. Um, I think on my end, I always try to, when I'm writing, write something that if not the world wants to read it, um, something that I would have wanted to read when I was this age. Um, I've always been drawn to books that center um, black women or young girls as the protagonists um, and center their lives because I've had many experiences and overheard conversations um, that decenter and sort of dismiss the lives of Black women. Um, so for me, that is anything that speaks to me and speaks to my experience that I'm writing about um, has to matter. And I have to believe that the story I create about girls, women like me have to matter as well. So I just, I guess my advice is anything that speaks to you, that not just speaks to you, but something that you can see yourself in your story um, is a story that matters because you matter, so. That's wonderful. Um, well, it looks like we have another question for Autumn. Uh, why did you choose to feature two male characters and what kind of non-male roles can we expect in the book? That's a great question. Um, really, the reason is because, like I mentioned when I was speaking earlier, I write to, to explore questions that I don't have the answer to. So um, I could have written about um, women, but I'm sort of really familiar with that experience, and I wanted to dig into an experience that I wasn't so familiar with. Um, so that was why the 1995 story was um, about a boy, and then um, I ended up switching the, the 1968 story to um, a male character as well, because I, you know, I saw that there was this gendered thing happening um, throughout the takeovers and the protests, and um, I'm interested in um, all experiences, and um, I'm really curious about the ones that are less familiar to me. So um, I guess the curiosity drives my passion to write. So I think that's why I go for what I don't know so well. I think we have time for one more question. Um, so how have you both managed to create slash revise in the middle of this pandemic and what does self-care look like for both of you now? Um, for me, well, the good thing is this story has been brewing for years now. So, um, by the time it was time to have the room and space and time to write, I was on it. So that was great. Um, and it was extremely intense. So in terms of just self-care at this point, I'm going to spend some time with my friends, hopefully, that I unfortunately didn't get to spend as much time with this year. Um, for COVID reasons and also just for writing reasons and also just for life reasons. Um, and self-care to me looks a lot like reading and watching this new collection of murder she wrote. I finally got all 12 discs and <laughs> a lot of just reflecting and maybe a little bit time away from writing for a bit. But that's what it's gonna look like for me. Um, for me, self-care has been taking daily walks, um, getting outside, getting fresh air, getting sunshine, um, prayer, um, and sleep, <laughs> um, and time with family as much as possible. Um, and managing to create and revise in this pandemic has been, it was easier earlier because I had a deadline for my draft. Um, and now I'm just trying to get back into the swing of things. It's, it's really about schedule and 
knowing what to expect of myself, not being too hard on myself. I answer one more question. My stepfather asked a question, so I'll just answer that since I, <laughs> since I still have the mic. What helps my creative juices? Um, you. <laughs> um, having artists in the family is really helpful and inspiring. Um, and knowing that, you know, it matters. Um, my mom's an artist. My stepfather is an artist. Um, and it's, it's just knowing that it's valued and that it's important. Um, that helps me keep going. Well, thank you, Shauna and Autumn. That was really terrific. And thank you to everyone listening at home. If you are an emerging author yourself, and would like to apply to be our next Shauna or Autumn, please visit www.writer-in-residence.org. That's writerinresidence.org. We'll be accepting applications for next year's program starting in February 2021. Finally, if you would like to support the Associates preservation work at the BPL, I'm excited to tell you about an upcoming event. From October 16th to the 25th, we'll, we're going to be hosting a literary auction. Such, it, this auction includes such items as private Zoom calls with authors like Gregory Maguire, who wrote Wicked, Lois Lowry, who wrote The Giver, John Grogan, who wrote that terrific dog book, Marley and Me, uh, original artwork by the New Yorker's Roz Chast, a tour of Jeff Kinney's studio where he creates Diary of a Wimpy Kid, a script for the first episode of Downton Abbey inscribed by the writer-creator Julian Fellows, or for your name to be included in my next novel. Please visit biditbookit.org, biditbookit.org to explore the auction items further. Thank you again so much and good night.